This is our work session for the month of June. And we're getting started a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties, but uh, we have a pretty full schedule and, and uh, we're gonna move along with it. First item is the approval of the agenda, which everybody's had an opportunity to, to review. Can I get a, a motion to approve the agenda? Chairman Ken Lehman, can we approve the agenda? Second. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion passes. So we're gonna go ahead and get on into the uh, uh, agenda part here. Call on uh, Dr. Jeff Church. Good morning, head of auxiliary services. Good morning. We have before you uh, surplus sales items for this past school year. And it's just for your information only. We sold uh, $6,272 worth of surplus this year. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah, is, that is that gut deals? Gut deals. It's all on gut deals. Yes, sir. Second part of our presentation, the guy's here. He's going to talk to you a little bit about our summer feeding and our feeding distribution. So, Good morning, everybody. Uh, board chairman and board members, superintendent. Um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about where we are with uh, our summer feeding program at this point, our uh, COVID-19, however you want to refer to it. Right now, uh, as of this week, we've served 574,818 meals. Um, with that said, um, 1,300 kids get it delivered on uh, yellow school buses and the other 2,000 are car pickups. Um, and our, our numbers uh, for car pickups seem to be dropping a little bit. Um, we've served as many as 68,000 um, and this week we've served 48,000 uh, meals. So it's kind of a, 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 it's kind of a drop. So we're gonna make some changes to our program as of uh, the 9th. We're going to uh, still do our bus delivery, and but we're going to do it a little different. Instead of doing it um, all in one day, we're going to split it up, and we're going to do South Caldwell on Tuesday, West Caldwell on Wednesday, and High Brighton District on Thursday. And all of them are going to be packed at High Brighton and delivered out from there because that way the buses are closer to the bus garage and any incidental things, we can get that taken care of. Guy, when you deliver, you're delivering seven days worth of meals when you do a delivery lunch. Yes, sir. Seven days, seven lunches, and seven breakfasts. Um, and that's a lot of milk. So we actually also, um, it doesn't mean that much to y'all, but we're going to switch and give out gallon of milk instead of cartons of milk on the starting on the night also. So we're doing that, make it easier to handle and less refrigeration space for uh, the parents. So hopefully that'll help with everybody. Um, Yes, you have to provide eight ounces of fluid milk per meal. So that's two cups a day. So uh, it'll actually give them a little bit more milk than what we have to, but it's actually 16 cents cheaper. Uh, so it's kind of a, a wash for us. Guy, um, if there are preschool children, um, birth to age five in your family, are we allowed to, to deliver from them as well if we're mm -hmm. already making a stop there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they, they, bus this time, the times I've ridden a bus, it was however many children's in the room or in the house, they leave that many bags and they got a list. I mean, they do a great job of organization because they know, like, if you pull up to this house, you got three kids here and they go off and then, you know, if, uh, we, one week we were on there, I was on there, they actually had to change. Right, but if there, if there are preschool families that don't have school age children, mm -hmm they contact the school that they would go to okay. and they add it to the list and then that list is compiled and then uh, the bus drivers have it and then they deliver it uh, from there. Will that manor still do the same through the summer? Would yes. they still contact the home school mm -hmm. of their district? Because uh, yes. so, you are doing a change so just so the public knows that that would be a continuation. Yes. Yeah, that uh, that way everybody can be serviced uh, Correct. from that point of view. Yeah. So, but we're going to do it from the home school and then from the school to the bus route. The only difference really is the Tuesday for South Caldwell District 
NC, West Caldwell, and High Brighton on Thursday. Uh, that's the now only major difference. Right. So, um, I do want to thank everybody that has participated and helped. Um, and I know um, Mr. Pennell has been out there. I've seen Dr. Phipps out there. And I'm not, I'm not sure about the rest of you. I think Kathy's been out there a good bit too, and you've been out there. So I do appreciate that. Y'all don't know, um, it does two things. One, our cafeteria staff who was working so hard to try to get this together and a change of what we're doing, but also they see that y'all care enough about our program and y'all have you know, shown that over and over and over and it really helps their, with their morale. So thank y'all very much for coming out and helping with that. And all our teachers and principals have come out and helped and that's been great too. So um, I do wanna thank everybody for that. And please uh, let them know how much we appreciate their frontline service. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I um, love the pickup too. What, you mentioned the, the bus drop offs. What about pickups in the summertime? Summertime, um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we'll still be doing the same, not excuse me, we'll be doing Granite Falls Elementary, Gamewell Elementary, and Valmede Elementary as our three pickup sites, and that's Tuesday only. And it'll be from 11 to 1 and um, 4 to 6. 11 to 1, 4 to 6. Yes, sir. And we'll be sending out um, flyers, and Libby's going to be doing a lot of um, publicity for us to try to make sure everybody knows that this will be changed. But everybody that gets a meal this week will get a flyer to let them know that of the change. Yeah, thanks, thank you. I only got picked up the summer, the three uh, summer uh, sites that you mentioned. Um, the three sites, yes, ma'am. Those are uh, pickup sites. The, the clients pick up the, no, no buses. No, no, no. We're going to do buses too. Buses too. Buses will, the change on the buses will be. South Caldwell District will be on Tuesday. West Caldwell District will be on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And Thursday will be High Bright District. All summer long. All summer long okay. at that, this point. That was the question. Thank you. I'll send y'all a flyer uh, just to let you know what everybody's getting and just in case y'all get any questions or whatever. Um, we're just now starting to get all this changed. Okay, any other questions? Thank y'all very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving along, uh, Dr. McKellen. Good morning. We have what we have with us this morning to present about um, the Jury's Technical Education Program, and then we are headed to our
here the total number of credentials, so it's 2013, um, the total number of credentials when we first started kind of keeping track of this. Credentials are very important in STEM. You should recognize credentials because students, when they graduate, they take these with them when they go to um, apply for a job. They're already certified and ready to go in some of the areas that they need. If it's just not staring stuff down at the top. Okay. Do more and offer more. The credentials cost money, and we have to pay for those. We have to have the funds for those. But we've been able to increase. We've been able to get our teachers on board. We've been able to get them certified so that they can offer the credentials instead of us having to go to a third party and bring somebody in to get some of those. So you can see each year we have grown, and we had our little party in December with the fifth of the state celebration. And that was because it was 4,616 to be on the end of. So as we still continue to move forward with this, fall semester. The total number of credentials is 3,116. That was just in one semester alone. So we were on track, if you want to multiply that for spring semester, for 6,200 for this school year. But then March 13th came and everything came to a stop. Um, still yet, in spring semester, we were able to get up until Friday, I've got the number, 2,040. Uh, we still have a week or two for students to be able to do that. We switched to remote. Uh, platform for students to be able to get their credentials Monday and our teachers have worked so hard. They had to learn the system and figure out how to do this remotely and, and get it all switched over. And I'm so proud of our teachers. They just jumped right on this. We have a couple weeks, I think, that students can um, still earn these so our numbers may change, but um, it's going to be around 5,100, I believe, is what our total for this year will be. That's my calculation. Um, Another piece of data that I have now that I didn't have the last time I met with you is our post assessment data, and that's 88 percent students have seen it remain the same. But we were 13th in the state, and that'll bring us up to 11th in the state. So we're moving ahead a little bit with that. Now, these two pieces of data, um, I've always felt like are very important, and I've always pushed on these out of the eight indicators. I've always pushed on these two, um, and these are two that are going to remain with Perkins Five. The credential piece is not in Perkins, Perkins 4. It is going to be in Perkins 5, so we're going to be held accountable for this number, and then we're going to be in a really good position to move forward with this when they start when they're able to collect data. Programs. I wanted to go over some changes and some things that we're going to be doing. Agriculture, uh, we have a position open at West Hall High School. We plan on refilling that position and it's posted, I believe, right now. Um, we have our agriculture teachers, by law, are sub month employees, so we will have them this summer. One of the projects I want to give people this summer is to take their agriculture curriculum and Convert it to a virtual curriculum so we can put it out in our virtual academy so students can take these courses online, even homeschool students from across the school, anybody can sign up for these courses. And up until March, I thought it was kind of impossible for some of our teachers to be hands on courses to be done virtually. So now I see how creative our teachers have become and how we really can make this happen. And I can even see it being a really good, positive thing. Even our food teachers, I've heard stories across the state of food teachers that would video themselves at home and can stay at home order fixing dinner for their family and video it and send it out to the students and said, here's the dish you need to make this week, here's why. So they did their lessons all week, and then the students would video themselves making the dish at home for their family and send it back in for their projects. So it really can, even, even a foods class, which is a hands-on, we have all the labs for that, it really can be done virtually. So the um, agriculture classes, the course, course culture one and two, we're thinking um, some of the projects that are in those classes are the, the whole life cycle of a plant and growing a garden, how to do the garden. You know, the garden thing now is real big with everybody trying to grow their own food and that kind of thing. So we're thinking, especially with the homeschool students, that 
created some virtual classes in the form of Chelsea 1 and 2 to be a positive thing for our program. Uh, ben Conley at South Caldwell also expressed some interest at the beginning of the year that he would like to add um, agriculture mechanics 1 and 2 to his curriculum. And I thought that was a, a great idea and move forward. We don't need to stay stagnant in what we've been doing for the last 20 years and as we move forward. What's important with this course is that it includes a welding curriculum. So we're going to be building uh, welding stations and we were right in the middle of getting ready to do that. Uh, in March, we, we ordered the equipment, all the equipment's there. We were going to have our masonry students come in and build the block station walls and have the contractor come in with metal bent, bending on top and uh, masonry was going to bring in the, uh, do the electrical, but we, we, we ran a standstill right now with that. So when we get through the track and they get ready to start working again on, on some of those projects, that's going to be one of the first things we do is get our welding stations finished up. Um, that will lead then to students can, if they want to progress in welding, then there's a certificate that are available to community college and we can either do their GED while they're still high school students. Our family and consumer science, um, students one and two, it was kind of suggested in the future that I would like to add those virtually also so that we can pair up horticulture one and two, we want to pair those together. While the students are growing their gardens or growing their food, they can be cooking the food or, or preparing it in the food form class. So fall semester, imagine a, maybe a homeschool student taking court one and um, student one together, and then in spring they'll take court two and student two. So it pairs up and it's a good long course for them that's unique to program age. Uh, we found that Friday that we got a grant so that instead of having to wait a year to add these students one and two, we'll be able to start that this summer and we have a teacher that's ready to convert that curriculum. We can pay a teacher to do that. We also have enough money to purchase Zoom for the students to come in. If it's a virtual class, they can come in like once a week, pick up their box of food. The, the condition of the grant was we purchased the food from local farmers or local um, sources. So we're going to be doing that and tying in the local, kind of like the farm to table idea or the farm to school kind of um, idea. So that's something that's going to be brand new. We found out on Friday um, that we're going to be doing that. Another course for our students that are here in Caldwell County Schools, the Intro to Culinary Arts, uh, we're going to be adding that course also. Before you go to that screen, uh -huh. those uh, virtual classes, are those ones that uh, carry the credentials? Uh, they be able to credential in those classes? They can, and before I was, you know, kind of hesitant to open up any virtual classes with credentials because we, we didn't know how they could get credentials at home, but now they can. So our students are getting credentials at home now. So it's, it's remote. The platform, the third-party vendors that serve most of our credentials have come up with a way to do those remotely. The proctor most of the time sits in on the <laughs> online tests that they're taking. Uh, sometimes they have to have video going, that's because nobody wants to sit there taking the test for them and that kind of thing. So they really come up with some creative ways to make that happen. So we can do that virtually also. Or, you know, if we have to set up a laptop for them to come in at one time, sometimes they can come in and perform in field uh, and do that. We can, we can make that happen. Thanks. Business and finance um, courses. Um, a hit this year because you know the, the legislature removed our first and finance class. It was our uh, course that we had the most enrollment. I think it was over 400 students this year signed up for our first and finance, so we're losing that. And also, DCI removed our multimedia web page design, so we've had to add some new courses. The, the, the big change that we're going to have in the business classes we're adding our Adobe Labs. Um, we had Adobe at um, Applied Science Academy, and we had it at Brighton in the printing department there with Ranger Tucker, and we have been upgrading those labs this year. Ranger got a new lab, and the uh, guy at um, Applied Science Academy got a new lab and some different tablets and some things they needed, some cameras. Um, we have a um, new setup with computers at each of the three other schools in high school now. We have um, a, a business lab for Adobe at High Brighton, one at West, and one at um, South Caldwell, we have also some computers that we're going to switch over, maybe add a second one at South Caldwell. We have four teachers that are right now doing online virtual training for their Adobe certification, so they'll be ready to start in two weeks. We have, I checked the enrollments, we have students signed up at each school to take those classes. So this is something we switched out um, for some of the courses that we've lost, and I think that's going to be a positive that the credentials attached to each one of these. The, the Photoshop and the 
engineer and the video editing and all this stuff that's uh, really cool and, and out there that we like to do now because of all the uh, internet and even the virtual things that, that we're doing on here. Tree development. One of the parts of Perfect Society, we had to send out surveys and survey a whole lot of teachers and things and visited parents and students and teachers and everybody to see kind of what their um, thoughts are or what the needs are, where they've seen things that are leading into what they want to see. And with employers, of course, it's the soft skills, workplace readiness skills. Everybody you know, says that that's what we need to pursue. But we have a course in career management. Um, I feel like that really all of our students probably should take this course. Um, we have it offered only at one high school um, this this year. We increased it by one teacher there. We added a couple sections at another high school this spring. Um, but next year we're going to have this at all three high schools, and that's another thing that we're going to do is replace some of the personal finance classes that we lost. We're going to replace that with career management. Uh, we have a teacher working on converting that one to virtual also, so that'll be out there. There's credentials attached to this one. The workplace readiness credential. There's eight credentials, and they go through each of these sections, like responsibility, um, how to get along with other people, collaboration, partnerships, teamwork, that kind of thing. So that should help um, our students um, with that. Health science. Um, one of the two of the big. I say these last two for last. Um, health science and construction. Two of the biggest industries that we have a need for, especially in Caldwell County, and, and everywhere for health science. Um, we, we need to keep um, all of our certifications going there. So what we're doing, I took, I um, only had one teacher that was trained and put in PCR instruction. And I was using her everywhere. I was picking her out of her classroom and sending her to go do all the, and I just stopped where I couldn't take, I just felt like that was too much of a burden on her when she missed too much class time. So this spring, we sent all of our health science teachers, even the ones from middle school, we have, we have six that we sent to be trained as CPR certified instructors. Um, then March came and well, they were in the middle of doing their own hands-on part that they have to do for, for finish their credential and uh, we're gonna have to wait until they have some time to do that. Um, we also added soft degree certification and first aid certification. And we always have had our CNA one license for our students and we have worked really hard, Dr. Fitz has, and everyone together trying to make sure that our students, our students got those hours they needed to get their state license exam taken, which will take place in the next couple of weeks. And so the students that were involved in that course are still be able to continue on. So that's been a, something weighing a burden on me, and I know Dr. Fitz too, uh, to try to make this happen. So it seems like a constant situation that we, we were able to do that. I've heard from families that they're very appreciative that those those students were able to get those clinicals in that y'all really did go the extra mile to make that happen because that would impact the courses kids were eligible to take right. the first year. These were seniors. Every student in that course was a senior and their goal maybe was to go to be a nurse or whatever and then in, in August when they went to the state place to have this in order to get to the nursing school. Um, so that was something very important. That was, it was almost a daily task we worked on to try to make that happen. So I'm, I'm glad that it, it all worked out. Everybody's doing good. They're going to be taking their tests, I think, this week. And uh, I know they're going to be good to go. Thanks. Um, so construction. We have two vacancies. And we're going to be able to replace both of those vacancies. We've had a teacher that we're able to move because um, we had some we lost some personal finance courses and there wasn't that many business courses to fill up there and that teacher had an interest in this and we were able to switch one over. Um, the other position uh, we're still working on um, to make sure that one gets replaced. But it's important that we get the right person in the right place, especially when a, when a vacancy comes up. We hear from this industry, especially in the construction field, of, of what they need in the classroom, who they need in the classroom, somebody that's going to have these students, you know, not just learn the skills, but ready to go to work what going to work means. Um, so we're going to be working on that. We have our NCCR certification and we've always had those um, and they're doing great. They're almost 110, just about 110 students in all these classes get their NCCR certification. We're going to add the OSHA 10 hour construction safety certification. That's something we've heard from Ms. Smithy. They'd like those students to come out with that OSHA safety uh, certification ready to go. And we are trying to, this is something brand new, I haven't had time yet to talk to those teachers to figure out exactly how to 
I'll make this happen. Um, I want to finish the school year before we throw anything else on the teachers right now. But um, we need to start building something in our classroom. It's a, you know, the enrollment month, right? Um, we need to do something to motivate students to, uh, to want to take the construction classes and, and see uh, the purpose instead of just trying to do, do something as a practice that they're really making something of it. That's useful and then they can see, um, you know, feel before their eyes as they're working on it. Um, so we're going to try a tiny house project. And we'll see how that goes. Um, Kathy, if you'll do the next slide for me. I've got some <laughs> pictures here. That, you know, other schools are doing this across, uh, all across the United States. I, there's pictures that this from somewhere maybe in Nevada or California or somewhere, I think. Um, that's a picture of the end product and the students there working on it. Um, They've been doing this for a few years, so it's not like this is something brand new. This is like three years old here, so each year they'll do one. And I think on the next picture, these are the students there, I think, still working on that. <laughs> they had three of these going, so this fit, they had progressed up to where they had three. And they're all three sitting under their little covered area there that they're working on. Um, so you've seen the little practice logs. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, if I'm a student, how, how long is it going to take me to get bored if I'm walking in and work, walking on working on a little practice problem, you know, then tear it down and build it back, tear it down. But if I'm working on something that I know at the end of the school year, it's going to be a finished product and it's going to mean something. What they do with these, they'll auction them off at the end of the school year and recoup their money. Um, so we only need seed money the first year to get it going, then that, that seed money we put back in and students have enough money then to... Um, make their next one, then they'll be free and clear. If they, if they start making a little bit of profit on each one, they'll add additional, um, buy some more equipment, or, or do whatever they need to do. Closer to home, this is West Henderson High School in Henderson County. So it's not just people way out west that are doing this, it's local, it's kind of local too. I talked to the director to see how that was going. Um, they were having it out for bids when I talked. I think they were getting it out, they were trying to get around 50000 I think, was their minimum bid. I think there was thirty thousand maybe dollars worth of um, materials that went into it. Um, so they had it out for bid when I talked to them. They have in the Asheville area a builders expo at the uh, Western North Carolina Ag Center there each year, and all the high schools that build these bring them there and they put, put them out for auction. That's where you know people from all over the state go to that um, builders expo. And they'll auction those off. Now I don't know if, if we get one. When we finish with it, it's ready to go. I don't know if they'll let us in up there to auction ours off there or not. But, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning the Dixie Metro Trade Center down here with the building expo and maybe high schools around in our area can do the same thing. Um, so I don't want to forget about our middle schools. And this is a little tricky. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you can you click on the picture. Is there a way to do that? The mouse? On the, yeah. yeah, click, click on it. Um, this is something I'm going to do for the middle schools, and it's important for them to visualize and see what CTE is, because they, some students may not even know what that is. Uh, there we go. It opens like a book. So it's a little guide or a book. And Kathy, you just want to flip through those pretty quick. It tells them what CTE is, gives them some data and some instructions there, um, certifications, career pathways. Now right here, this is a career assessment. This is a little test they take, and we give this to every eighth grader and ninth grader. Um, and if they'll check those little boxes and total up the number at the bottom, it will tell the student what their aptitude is toward a certain area. Um, and it'll tell them what kind of careers are um, lined up with that. And Kathy, if you want to go all the way to the very last page, and then back up one page. And then at the end, this is a plan for the future. It's like the four-year plan, something they can keep or work on. It's the list of what they should do in ninth grade. This is freshman year, sophomore, junior, senior. So it gets them to start thinking about what they're good at according to that test that they would take, and then what kind of jobs are related to it, what the outlook for that job is, and then here's a, how they can plan their future in their next four years. I think if we start this and get this to the eighth graders, it will get them to thinking about their pathway, thinking about what, you know, we, we do this in our classes anyway, but if they have this, maybe it's something that they can, it's a visual, we'll have our career development coordinator
to go there and work with all the eighth graders and just do the gig and work with them. They can take it home, their parents can look at it, and it'll give them something tangible that they can hold on to. You, when you see FNC online for them to do this kind of work, and it's something they can always log into and have, but this will be a little quick to learn guide and something they can do there to start working with the middle schoolers with their career plan. And that wraps up the updates and presentations. Um, are there any questions? but this is, we always get so excited about where we're headed with career and technical assistance and opportunities for our students. And for the key community, that what that the opportunities are here within our high schools, there is a variety of um, different options that they have for them. But so thank you. Um, Mr. Snell, can I go on to the sure, next slide? Okay. So we also, on the agenda, that we have summer learning and remote instruction. So just to give you a little bit of background, as part of House Bill 1043, um, we are required to do summer learning for in reading and math for our rising first through fifth graders. Um, there is a small pot of money attached with that um, as part of House Bill 1043, but that's going to be divided among all of the um, public school districts in North Carolina and the charter schools. So we also included some funding funding in our COVID-19. I know it's later on in the agenda as well. Um, but we will be doing some summer learning um, with that. We also, with um, the monies that we'll, we're getting from our application for the COVID-19 funds, we'll be doing some things at the middle school and the high school. High school will be more credit recovery. Um, we're still waiting on official guidelines from DCI as to what the requirement will be. More than likely, it probably will be remote learning unless you're given different guidelines from Governor Cooper and or from the State Board of Education or the Department of Public Instruction about reentry into the schools. But we will be providing some opportunities for certainly our elementary students in reading and math. And then we're looking at some, uh, trying to do some virtual camps for our middle school because they traditionally haven't had a lot of opportunities this summer and then credit recovery at the high school level. So we will be doing seeing some summer learning this summer um, in addition to that, as part of Senate Bill 704, we have our remote instruction plan that we have to create, and we'll actually do that before the board in the July meeting that has to be approved by the Board of Education. Um, part of the plan uh, with this calendar this year, we will have five remote learning days. So those will be incorporated into the remote instruction plan, as well as more long-term remote learning. So in the event that we can't be face-to-face -face or face-to-face -face with all students in August, here is our plan for remote learning um, and remote instruction for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, there are going to be 13, there are 13 requirements for the plan from the legislature, and then the State Board have added two more requirements to the plan. So there will be 15 points in the plan, but you'll get a more detailed explanation. We're just in the process of figuring out what it is that we need to do. If you, you saw, I think when Libby posted something about surveys, we are currently surveying parents, teachers, and students about their remote learning experiences so that we can take that feedback and use it as we design what this will look like in 2020 and 2021. So if a parent's asking you, should I fill out the survey, please encourage them to fill out the survey because we need that feedback to make sure that we can address the needs, um, their needs as a parent, um, as well as the needs of their students um, and addressing what our teachers need to make sure that they're prepared to continue remote learning if we need to in the 2020 and 2021 year. Any questions about that? We'll see you again in July. Thank you, Dr. McKellen. Next uh, on the agenda, we have a closed session guide here, a motion session. Chairman Kuhl, I move that we go into closed session pursuant to the uh, current agenda. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we will be in closed session for uh, a few minutes here.
and student support services, which is Travis Gillespie and Robert Semple. So I'd like to let you all know that that doesn't require a vote, but I certainly want to make you aware of it. Item number two, I want to give you an update on the 2020-2021 calendar, both for <coughs> traditional schools and for the, the Applied Sciences Academy and our early college. The first calendar that you saw that was a draft after we uh, dealt with the changes that were required by the General Assembly actually included some extra days that we put in. We were able to go back and get a little bit more clarification on what the intent was on the law. And what we're required to do was to add five remote learning days into our calendar, and we had to increase the number of student days by five days. We went in on, on a second pass through and were able to create remote learning days primarily on days that we had originally scheduled as planning days. And because they're remote learning days now, they can be counted as student days. So we were able to get uh, remote learning days added and student days added at the same time. The, the big point of all of this is it allows us, we have to start on that 17th of August. And we had already scheduled a, a start date on the 17th of August, but our ending date will be the Friday before Memorial Day. And you can see that in the bottom left-hand corner, the little purple uh, square that's there in the month of May. Um, right there where Kathy's at. That would be the ending time that we have. And then the early college and the Applied Sciences Academy calendar, probably closer to what we have on our traditional side than we have been. And the reason for that is that we had the early start date for our, ourselves that we had created on the 17th, which is now state mandated for a year. And you can see their calendar there as well. We're not asking for approval today. We wanted to share these with you for review, but then we'll bring, be bringing these back on Monday night at our board meeting for approval be to meet the requirements that are now in legislation for the upcoming year only. Item 5C, I just want to give you an update on the COVID-19 funds and the grant update. We've been talking quite a bit for the last few months of different pots of money that will be made, made available. Uh, this came up some in our conversation that we had a few, a few weeks ago as well when we were looking at some other uh, items of interest. We received a pot of $450,000 that was CARES money that came to us that was restricted for either remote learning, child care, cleaning buildings and buses, child nutrition, some restrictions like that that we're, that we're working on. That $450,000 uh, will be used for those purposes. There's an additional $2.3 million that's available uh, through the federal government that we had to make an application for. Uh, Katrina and Lisa and the, the rest of the curriculum team have done that work that was due today. Uh, we've made the request and I think we've already heard that. <coughs> we received the full amount of $2.3 million that we, we requested. And, and that's not a um, just a pot of money that's brand new. There are specific things that we have to do. The summer camp that we're required to do by law, the jumpstart work that has to be done, the remote learning efforts that we're carrying on, child nutrition work. There's just many, many things as you heard today, there are a lot of different areas of criteria that we have to meet. And so from that point of view, I would say the 2.3 is restricted to that type of work. We wouldn't have been able to do it out of our regular budget, but it's required now and we have the funding. We have an additional uh, bit of money that's come in that uh, David's working with in finance, and it's very restricted on what we can't do with it. Uh, a lot of it looks like it would go in the area of child nutrition. So we're trying to figure out through the states uh, how, how those restrictions can really be worked. It's, an, it's another pot of money that would help us I think you heard Guy say, if I wrote it down correctly, uh, 574,882 a year. You know, there's, there's food that has to be purchased, there's labor that's involved with that, there's diesel fuel, the use of the buses, all of those things that come into play as we're dealing with fuel distribution. We're hoping that this extra money that we've gotten could help pay for that. So we'll give you an update, but we are working with every opportunity for grant funding or other uh, funding sources that come available to help us do the work that we're doing not just now, but down the road uh, as we continue. Uh, I, I wanted to give you a re-entry update for 5D for the 2020-21 uh, re-entry of school in August. And right now I can't tell you anything. I've heard a lot of rumors out in the public and I can tell you 100% accurate with, with full disclosure, those are all rumors at this point. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is gonna have a meeting with our state school board on Wednesday. Uh, we have a call Wednesday afternoon, and at that point, I think we'll have a little bit more guidance. Uh, what we're going to hear about is guidance on reopening and re-entry. <coughs> this could be, you know, the use of uh, personal protective equipment, what's going to be required. Or, you know, we don't know the answer to all these things yet. What do mass gatherings look like? What about athletics? What about band and course and cafeterias? Um, 
are we going to be scanning students? We don't know the answer to that. So I can't tell you that we will or we won't. We just don't know yet. Will there be some kind of an alternating schedule with students? Will students be eating in the classrooms instead of the cafeterias? All of those are things that we've heard. We just don't know yet. So we're waiting for guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services. And there are six work groups that are going on right now across the state that are dealing with things like eating. And once we have that information, uh, we'll be sharing that with you. I, and I, I feel comfortable that we'll have more guidance when we meet on the 8th, and I can share some of that publicly. I'm a little concerned right now that we're talking about early June. And we have no idea what's going to happen in the next 60 days. So you all know August may look very different depending on what happens. So the guidance that we get is going to be guidance as of June. Don't know whether or not that will uh, carry any weight when we get into August, but I can at least share with you what we're dealing with. We'll also be talking about, in just a couple minutes about athletic guidance and things that are going on uh, throughout the school system and across the state. And then the jumpstart stuff that you heard Dr. McKellen mention, we have uh, allotments and guidance in the next, this coming week right now. It's going to be a busy week this week because we're in. We'll get our allotments and our guidance for what they're calling jumpstart. And there's a, a webinar on June the 2nd uh, for technical pieces that our staff members will get. So. Uh, we're talking about things right now that we haven't gotten details about, but we will have those this week. So we'll be sharing that with you as much as we can. Uh, Dr. McKellen also mentioned Senate Bill 704 and House Bill 140, 1043. These are two COVID bills. Uh, there's some legislative work that's going on with that that may involve a little bit of tweaking that has to be done on, on different pieces, and we'll give you some updates when that comes along as well. Uh, item 5E is the High School Athletic Association update, and I was going to ask Dr. Church, he sent something out. This morning, if you want to talk about that uh, a little bit, you can. We had, a, we had an original start date back June the 1st, and I think everybody knew that June 1st was too early, and we had decided we weren't going to do that, and then the High School Athletic Association decided to push back the, the date. And I think right now we're looking at June the 15th and kind of waiting to see what happens on June the 15th. So, Jeff, you want to talk about that? Yeah, speaking of the High School Athletic Branch, they're thinking June the 15th may not happen either. It might be pushed off some more. I share a document with you, um, put it up on the screen. Derek Reeves has put this together with help with our uh, other two athletic directors, Jeff Carr and Ms. Susan Matson, plus athletic directors across the, the district. And it's return to play. And it's a work in progress. Uh, received this last week, he sent me something to use during closed session, an update that he and his trainers have been working on. So we have shared this with the health department, and they are. Um, they're good with what we're doing. So we do have a plan in place whenever that dead season is over. We'll continue to work on that again, looking for guidance, but in terms of how we do the even the athletic piece and, and you know, how you, if, if you were to do sporting events, what do they look like? You know, what, what are the audience, the folks that are there that are in the stands, what are the limitations? We don't know the answer to those yet either. Five F, it, it took us a while to get to a point where we felt like we knew what we wanted to do in the area of high school graduation. I'll be honest with you, we were waiting this out to see if there were going to be some changes from the executive order. But with the last executive order that came out said that the mass gatherings did not apply to educational institutions. And we felt like that opened the door for us to be able to have outdoor graduations very similar to the Air Force Academy style, social distancing, limiting the number of people that came in. And we got word back on that, that executive order came out on a Monday. On Friday, we got word back that the exemption did not apply to public schools with respect to graduation. So we're still under the limitations that we were. The executive order does allow us to have some summer um, learning camps and things like that after the school year is over. So our, our plan, and I want to say this just so everybody here is on the same page and the public is aware of this as well. I had multiple meetings with high school principals, multiple meetings. Uh, we also had meetings with representatives from our seniors at the my feeling was that the graduation activity is the culmination of their years of work, and we want this to be meaningful to them. And we offered the ability for us to delay the service and have a, a traditional ceremonial type of a graduation service and tell them that we may have to wait uh, or we could look at some other options. And I think initially the idea was to hang on and wait, and we hoped that we'd be able to do it. And we know right now that even into the third or fourth week of July, you're going to be limited on mass number of gatherings. I have no idea what's going to happen from July to August and beyond. So our, our traditional high schools decided that they wanted to go ahead and work on putting something together. 
Wes Caldwell, their students wanted to have an individual ceremony. And that these, as you all know, are gonna be scheduled Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week. Students will come in for about 10 minutes. They'll be in their full uh, regalia. They'll have an opportunity to bring family members in with them. Uh, they'll walk uh, across, they'll get a diploma. They'll have their time there. Uh, and we're gonna, it's gonna take about three days to get that done. The other, the other two high, South Caldwell and, and West uh, and High Brighton, are gonna do more of a drive-in approach. The drive-in piece would be students would come in limited to one vehicle passenger car for our student or passenger vehicle for students. There'd be an actual ceremony that will be live that they'll have the opportunity to witness and then students will come down in groups of 20 and they'll be allowed to come across and, and get their diploma. That'll happen at, West, at uh, South Caldwell and High Brighton. And then the Applied Sciences Academy has already done uh, a individualized graduation and they're, they're ho hopeful that they'll be able to do a more of a, a formal ceremony, traditional type of a meeting. They've got that scheduled the first week in August. I can't remember the exact date. I don't have those in front of me. The 5th, 6th, and 7th, I think, are the dates of the, the Applied Sciences Academy, the early college is going to do theirs then, and then the community college has graduation. But we're not clear yet whether or not the restrictions are going to be lifted for indoor gatherings. So those dates have been put out just to kind of hold. Craig Styron has also, in addition to the individual graduation, he, he scheduled the uh, Civic Center for the 31st of July, and he'd like to do an indoor traditional ceremony if he can, but the idea there being we may have to push that back. So he wanted to at least get the individual portions of those done. What does that mean? It means that, that our schools are doing something different at each school, but those schools, we gave them permission. You all said you wanted to allow us to work with the principals and the seniors, and there were surveys done, there was feedback provided. So this is one of those situations where there's no solution that we can come up with that's going to satisfy everybody. I know it's going to hurt some people in terms of the number of guests that they have. It's going to hurt others because they would prefer to have their students in an, in an auditorium with all of their peers. And we just can't do both of those things at the same time because we have limitations that we have to abide by. I've listened, listened to the feedback from a lot of other districts that have had graduation ceremonies in the, in the prior two weeks. And those have been everything other than traditional. And I think they've gone off well, all things considered. And it, it, I heard for our seniors, uh, I heard for the family members that, that have always thought about what it was going to be like for those graduation ceremonies. But we want to make these as meaningful as we can. And we'll continue to do that work. So I'm excited. This week is a week of graduation for us. It, again, we'll look different than it has. But um, you know, we're, we look forward to, to being able to bestow the honors and the privileges and the opportunities on our seniors that they've long and their families have long waited for. So that was my graduation update. Our policy revision that we're going to we put up. The, the, Kathy, do we need anything on this? Or this it's just for their information. This this uh, one, one of several policies that you all are, are probably going to see in, in the weeks and months ahead. This is policy 2302, remote participation in board meetings. And this has come out of the COVID-19 and a different way of operations that we have. So I wanted you to be aware of that. And then for the end of year wrap up, and Katrina, if you want to chime in on this, you certainly can. Uh, this is the week that students will be coming back to school in small numbers to pick up some of their belongings. Uh, we have teachers that will be on campus uh, more. We're trying to have more of a return to work, but doing it in an organized fashion so that we don't violate any of the requirements that we have in terms of safety and what our governor's executive order is. Uh, no more than 10 people in a, in a gathering indoors in a room. Uh, and we also want to make sure that students have the opportunity to get any items, either pick them up from school or bring items back that they have had at home. Uh, so we have a lot of that going on uh, this week. Certainly different than what any end of the year ever has been that we're dealing with and we're trying to make the most of it. My, my last item is item 5i with other information. The only thing that I've got on my list that I've not covered uh, with you really deals with funding and the budget. And David and I talk many times in, in any given week about where we're at with the budget. And, you know, I, I mentioned when we started talking about budget and we got into the, the month of March, and it was pretty evident that we were going to be operating different in a different manner than we normally do, that we may have an opportunity to, to be able to see some funds 
that we haven't spent. And, and the reason for that is if you just think about substitute costs that we budget for that we haven't had to spend, the cost of diesel fuel that we haven't had to spend for buses, our utility costs that are out there, and then things like you know conferences and conventions and activities that people were involved in. There's a registration fee for that. There's per diem for meals. There's travel that goes along with that. There's regular travel that happens uh, in, in, in any given month. Because all of those things are going to be still unspent to some degree, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to be able to get through this school year and not have the impact on our fund balance that we thought we would. And David and I have talked, and, and with, with questions about what the reaction from the public would be on that, I want to be very honest about it. You know, we're, we're grateful that we got an opportunity to not spend what we thought we were going to. I, I hate, it's, it, it really bothers me that it's coming at the expense of COVID-19 and, and the, the things that have, the public has incurred from that, including debt, but certainly a, a jobs that have been lost and other things like that. But we, you know, we can't budget year in and year out expecting some type of a pandemic or a calamity that's going to come along that's going to cause us to operate differently. So, you know, at the end of the year, I am hopeful that we'll be able to share with you a, a brighter picture uh, that, that has been uh, bestowed upon us through a pandemic that we certainly didn't expect or couldn't predict. But uh, we don't know yet what the final outcome will be. Uh, we feel like some of the funding that we've gotten here will help us offset some of the costs. But I, I know there's some folks that feel like we've got extra funds here. These, these funds are here because we're having to do extra things that we weren't going to do otherwise. And they're limited and restricted. And it causes us to have to spend within certain categories. But I, I hope to be able to come back to you in the month of July and to the public and be able to say, you know, we've had a target that we've been chasing for a couple of years, and this is where we are with the current update. But understand that there was an artificial infusion of some funding this year that we didn't expect and we can't count on down the road. But uh, we continue to look at that and continue to work on the budgets and the cost savings and the, the work that we're trying to do to be as fiscally responsible and in as strong a financial position as we can be. So uh, don't be surprised if we come back and we say we've been able to finish out the school year and this is what we actually dealt with from fund balance. And we don't know what that number is going to look like yet, but I want you to understand and the public to understand why we're at that point. And, and we feel that that's a positive. That's all I have to say. Okay. Chairman, I'm sorry, but we needed to uh, approve to put the calendar on the common period to be approved. On June 8th. So those would be up for public review starting today, and then we would vote on them on June the 8th. They've been out and circulated quite a bit, uh, the draft versions I think folks have seen, but we would like that to request that we discuss that in the Okay, do I hear a motion that we approve the 2020 21 calendar update for the uh, uh, traditional schools as well as those for the Applied Science Academy and the Early College High School. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I understood that it was with, to put it up for comment. True. That's true. Not to approve it. Not to approve it. We're not, we're not approving it. it. It is for a 30 day comment period. Well, actually, until the next week. <laughs> it, it will be uh, for a comment period until our next board meeting. I move that we put the, um, the 2020-2021 calendar updates so the traditional schools and for the CASA and the early college high school on the comment period until we meet in the spring. That's the motion. Okay. Any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Any other items, anything else from the board? Okay, that being the case, do I hear a motion we adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And motion passes.